evening everyone. Welcome back to my channel, True Crime with Jess Rose. And tonight I'd look at, like to look at uh, the sad story of Becky Watts. This goes back to 2015. And this features on two shows. It's an ITV, I think it's a one-off, which is the murder of Becky Watts, the police tapes. And it's also on Faking It Tears for Crime. So... Becky Watch, she lives at home with her dad, Darren, and her stepmother, Angie. Now, Angie's been in Becky's life since she was two, uh, so, you know, a close family. Angie's also got a son called Nathan. Now, um, in 2015, Becky would have been 16 and Nathan was 28. I doesn't live with them. Um, he actually lives about a mile away with his girlfriend, Shauna Hall. And Shauna's 21. And basically, Becky just goes missing. On the 20th of February, 2015, she just vanishes into thin air. And her stepmom and her dad are obviously frantic. Like, where's this girl gone? And the last people to actually see or he from Becky was Nathan and Shauna. Don't forget, Nathan's his stepbrother and Shauna's his girlfriend. And they were at the mum and dad's. And they said that they heard who could only have been Becky, she was the only person in the house at the time, come down the stairs and go out and slam the door behind her. And that was that was all they said when, you know, Angie and Darren got home, you know, oh, she's gone out. So Becky doesn't come back. Angie and Darren are frantic, you know, Nathan and Shauna go home and, you know, they're, they're getting really stressed and, on the, like I said, this is on the 19th of February, on the 20th of February, they call the police in, you know, there's, there's something terribly wrong, she's not like this, she, you know, she goes to bed early, Becky does, she's not, She's not a typical teenager that would sneak out or, you know, stay out till all hours. She was a really responsible girl. And so they bring in a detective by the name of Richard O'Connor. And he says straight away, he the alarm bells rang, you know, because a lot of teenagers do go missing their brows with their parents or they want to go meet someone of the opposite sex. And they do go missing and they do, you know, turn up the next day and... But one thing with teenagers now and also in 2015 is their social media. They're always on there, whether it be Facebook, Snapchat, WhatsApp, whatever, you know. And all her social media had stopped. All of it completely stopped on the 19th of February. So they knew that was, you know, out of the ordinary anywhere. Her laptop was still in her bedroom. You know, her phone was there. There was... She took nothing with her, which for a 16 year old girl, especially Becky, she was quite popular. Everyone knew, her friends know, you know, this isn't like her. And, you know, they they started panicking quite quickly. You know, where where's this girl gone? So they hold a press conference with Darren, uh, Becky's dad, and Pat Watts, who's her grandmother. And appealing you know for Becky to come home or if anyone's seen her or possibly her so you know please let them you know a real heart-rending press conference so on the 25th of February the police you know in all the stories I've done you notice that they always start from the family and work out so they bring all the family members in all her friends in and look Sam these programs you see the interviews especially on the ITV one the police types one you see the interviews with her friends and her family you know and how distraught they are and you know they they, they just want to help they just want to help to get this girl home but the two people who actually were the last ones to see her are the hardest to get hold of and that's Nathan and Shauna you know they have the police have real trouble getting them in to be, you know, just to be, just to be questioned, just to see if they know anything more, and eventually they get them in, and they're quite, they're quite cocky when they're talking. They're quite, you know, she's explained. You know, you see her on there. She's laughing. She's laughing when she's being questioned. She's, it could be like she's talking about 
the weather or, you know, having a chat with someone that she worked, you know, it's, it's not, it, it doesn't come across in the, when you're watching the interview that she's being questioned over this missing 16 year old girl, her boyfriend's little sister in effect. You know, she's been in that family since she was two. She's his little sister. And his interviews are saying, very like back, you know, quite cocky, you know. Oh, you know, she went I, you know, she's in a bit of a strap and she left. You know, all very, very questionable. And what was really questionable that the detectives and the interviewing team started to notice was their story fitted together very, very, very well. Um, and what I mean by that is they were saying that even the most credible witnesses and the most honest witnesses, sometimes their stories differ from, you know, different people's point of view. And theirs didn't, theirs didn't sway from the truth. Well, from their version of the truth whatsoever. It just beat it together a little bit too, too well. So they, they had their eyes on these two. From there, they knew something. They weren't giving something away. So the forensics team during this time have gone into Becky's house and obviously checked looking at a room, you know, see if they can find anything. And there's very small, uh, the detective explains, not visible to the naked eye, but, you know, the forensics team, they've got all the stuff and they find three blood spots on the door frame of Becky's bedroom and they also find a fingerprint within those blood spots so they have to send that off straight away you know find out who the fingerprint is and also whose blood it is and in the meantime they're still searching you know they still have got this girl as a missing girl they want to bring her back alive you know, they're, they're questioning these two, but they're, they, you know, they're hoping for the best. They really are. And at this moment, it's still a missing persons case. Um, and because our, their story fitted together too well, they were very suspicious of Nathan and Shauna. So they bring them back in for questioning and they, uh, you know, interrogate them a little bit more, go a little bit deeper. And it turns out that Nathan doesn't like it, Becky. He doesn't think she even she shows his mom enough respect you know there's no real love loss between them well while nathan's and shauna are in for questioning the dna uh the dna or the fingerprint um is proven to be his it comes back that that's actually nathan's fingerprint in the blood now they still don't know exactly who the blood belongs to but the fingerprint is definitely him they don't tell him they don't tell him they know that, but they, you know, they're, 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 they're pretty sure now something very untoward has gone on in that house. Then the DNA results come back and it's Becky's blood. His fingerprint has been found in Becky's blood outside Becky's bedroom. So they arrest them both. They arrest them both and that's on the 28th of February. I bring them both in. And now they've got um, right to uh, search their house because Nathan and Shauna lived about a mile away from Becky and Becky's mum and dad. But they, uh, Shauna especially, still seemed very confident, very loud. But, and like I say, I'm saying this from watching it. You know, if you watch either show, she's very jovial. She's, you know, it, again, it gives them away because that's not a normal reaction to what's going on at all if even if you're not involved why would you be sat there laughing and joking with the police team or trying to make light of the situation it doesn't make sense and you know they don't change their story you know stick 100 percent to it and at this point although the police know they're involved they're hoping desperately that becky's alive they're still holding on so they, they're going to get this girl back alive so you know they still have got it down as a missing persons case they're still searching so like i say they are searching their home and at that point start to because nathan's very controlling and up until that point he'd been controlling all these police interviews well they turned tables on him then they already knew the fingerprint was his they already knew the blood was back his so they asked him how 
you know, and you see it happening in the show. They're like, where is she? Where, where is Becky? Do you know where she is? Is she still up? And you can see these questions are hitting him like a brick because up until that point, he'd been in control of these interviews, just like Sean was. They were very, very odd couple, very, uh, just very weird. I'd like, you know, I'd say. Um, so when the police are searching Nathan and Shauna's house, they've got, I think it would be the GoPros, the cameras on their chests, and you see, you see them going to the house. <sighs> their house, shocking. Uh, one or both were hoarders. You know, it was a disgrace. The house was, and also, it took them ages to get actually get in the house because there was two refrigerators behind the front door and. You could see that the living room was mountains high of just rubbish and at the kitchen everywhere. But when they went upstairs and go into the bathroom, although the bathroom on one side is just full of, again, electrical stuff, just really random stuff, the bath was immaculate. Now, remember when I'm saying this house is a tip, it's a dive, it's, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to sit down in it, you, you know, but they go into the bathroom and the bathtub itself, you see, you can see reflections in it. It's, it's spotless. And, uh, you know, it, again, that brings up awful questions. You know, something's not, not quite right here. It's really not. So while the forensics have done that, they've checked the bath now and they're checking the rest of the house. So they go up into the loft and while they're in the loft, they find a bag with some receipts in it. And... When they get the receipts out, the forensics team, this case takes a real time for the worst um, because the receipt was for goggles, gloves and a circular saw. And so they, um, the forensics team obviously get straight in touch with the detective, um, you know, who knows the store, goes there, looks at the CCTV, gets CCTV again, you know. They always get caught, don't they? Um, showing Nathan the day um, Becky is said to have left the house and gone missing. There he is walking along, glutton, not caring the world, picking up a circular saw. Actually, there's footage of him looking and asking advice on the best one, the best circular saw to buy, along with gloves and goggles. So, um, the detective knows this case has took a really bad time now. So he speaks to Becky's mum and uh, the stepmom and dad, Nathan's mum, and says, you know, we believe it. We believe Nathan and Shauna are definitely involved. We don't know to what extent, but this isn't going to be, you know, it's not going to be a good out outcome. It's really not. So at this point, Shauna's still lying through her teeth. She's claiming she's sticking to that story. When they're in the house, she went outside for a cigarette. She come back in. She had the door slam. You know, it was to a tea every single time. You know, but she was very, very cold. She was very, very cold. And Kerry Dines, who is a profiler on the show Faking It Tears of a Crime, she actually calls her kind of a Lady Macbeth. No, she's very cold, she's very calculating, she's very cocky, she's above the whole situation. And at that point, they didn't have anything to connect her at all to, to anything. So although they, they knew something wasn't quite right with this girl, they had nothing. Whereas they did have with Nathan, obviously they had the CCTV footage of him, combined with the fingerprint in Becky's blood, you know, they charge him. They charge him um, with murder on day 13 of Becky's disappearance. And although they've got nothing uh, concrete on Shauna, they charge her with perverting the course of justice because they need to keep her in. They need to keep looking because they know this girl's involved as well. So because they'd had them at that point for, I think it's nine to six hours, they had to charge them or let them go. And like I say, he was charged with Becky's murder and she was charged with perverting the course of justice. Um, and yeah, they start um, finding Shauna's phone and piecing together, you know, things that they'd got from there. And 
they start to see a very, very different side to this relationship, a very dark side, where the texts were, they were basically saying, should we kidnap a girl? Let's kidnap a young girl and we'll keep her as, keep her in the house locked up. And just very sexual, perverted text messages, you know, between 28-year-old man, a 21-year-old girl, you know, and she actually sends a text to Nathan at one point saying, oh, I've just passed this cute, petite little girl. I wish I'd have knocked her out and dragged her home. So, yeah, you know, really twisted kind of text messages to each other. So they've got these. Um, and Nathan, now, now, you know, look where he is. He knows he's done. He makes a prepared statement, Nathan does. Now, don't forget, up until this point, they both claim she left the house, they know nothing of it. Nathan kind of knows the end's coming now with the evidence they're collecting. He doesn't know about the text messages yet, neither does Shauna, but he knows, you know, the net's are closing in, so he makes a prepared statement. Now, in that statement, you see, you see on the show, he doesn't want to hear it played back to him or spoken back to him. So he puts his hands in his ears, like a, like, a child, like a child. So he can't hear his own statement that he prepares read back to him. And in the statement, what he says is that he wanted Becky to show his mum more appreciation. You know, it's Becky's stepmom. He said she was spoiled, she was a nice person, she treated his mum like rubbish. And what he wanted to do was scare her, scare her into appreciating her life. So his plan was to kidnap her, scare, obviously wear a mask, scare her, you know, get her to appreciate the life she's got. And as he gone into her bedroom and kind of tried to grab her, she's pulled at his mask, seen who he is, he's panicked and he strangled her. That's honestly what he says. Now, even his own mum didn't believe him. Even she didn't believe him. And bearing in mind they've got these text messages, no one believes that. But one thing he's very adamant at is that Shauna knew nothing. He is adamant this girl knew nothing about it. She's completely innocent. You know, she was no part to this whatsoever. Um, so, yeah, he just basically says it's um, a complete accident, he's done what he's done, and then, bear in mind Sean and I part of it, then he, he carries her into the bathroom, very, very like the uh, Lindsay Quall story, brings her into the bathroom and cuts her up, he dismembers his sister in the bath. Very like the Gemma McCluskey story. I mean, there's no possible other answer. There's nothing else you can think of doing. Absolutely nothing. There's You can't phone the police and give them that story. You can't try and phone an ambulance and see if there's any... No. First thing these people think, I'm going to cut them up. So he tells the police he dismembers her. He puts up... Now, one thing about Becky, she was tiny. She was very... Okay very similar to these other cases as well. Very petite, Brunner, much lower than I would describe in the text messages. Um, and uh, yeah, Jack puts her into bags, suitcases, and he puts them in his friends who lives a few doors down shed, in the Fred shed, friend's shed. That's where he puts his sister. And then give, he, I can't even say he gave the impression of the distraught brother he didn't he didn't from the get-go he might as well have just told them from the beginning so they find becky obviously and the mum and dad do get to see her and they said the police tried their best to you know cover up just so they could say goodbye but the dad it's heartbreaking to watch the dad does say that they could tell where he decapitated her I mean, that's his stepson, that's his wife's son, who's done that to his daughter. I mean, 
you, oh, no words, no words, no words. But the police themselves, um, they just don't buy this story. They don't. They they don't buy that he did this alone. There's not. It, it, it's not feasible. It's not feasible that this it, she couldn't have known. So when they've found Becky and obviously the suitcases, there are face masks in these suitcases. And guess whose DNA is on one of the face masks? Shauna Horse, obviously. And um, I think she's got some DNA on Becky as well. Straight away. She was in. Charged with murder straight away. Which I think they were relieved at. And you, you can't blame them. You know, this girl was so cocky. She was so, there was actually a bit where they say, um, you know, something like, how can you prove you weren't part of this? Or, because she's, and they ask her, you know, when did you know what you did to Becky? And she goes, I only found out when you did. And how, how can you prove that you weren't part of it? Well, there's no proof, is there? There's no DNA. There's no forensics to put me there. That's how cocky she was. You, after watching it and after watching her interview, you're so glad they get her. You're so glad. So they're both charged with the murder, a sexually motivated murder of Becky. And they basically, uh, yeah, they're both charged. Nathan is found guilty of murder. He gets life with a minimum of 33 years. Well, I mean, he'll be older. He'll be, you know, he'll be older. But will he serve that? That's a little sister. Again, a little sister. Shauna was found guilty of manslaughter. No, they, they found no proof to say that she was there when he actually killed Becky. You know, they now believe that he did go into the room. Um, but not with the intention of scaring her or this whole pretense that he put on. He went in to subdue her and they were going to kidnap her and bring her back to their house and God knows what they'd have done. I believe that they say he has mixed. Look, I'm faking it to of crime. You've got the listener and she says he mixes the truth with lies. He does. And uh, they think that she did pull his mask down obviously recognised who he was and he strangled her there and then but it what he was making out that wasn't planned it was all planned but Shauna herself then got involved after the fact and you know brought her back to their house into the bathroom you know helped dismember her helped get rid of her you know she was 16 she'd done nothing she'd done nothing no, he'd known her since she was two you know, the he there was you know, he was twelve years older, you know, he'd known her it's just awful, it's just awful. And she was found guilty of manslaughter because like I said, she didn't actually take part in the murder as as such, but she was involved in everything else, the clean up afterwards, and she got seventeen years. She you know, everyone on both shows has made it clear that they believe she was the, the power behind this. Like I said, the Lady Macbeth, as Kerry Dine says, it, she was she was the main person behind it. it she should have got the sign. She should have got the sign. 100% believe that. Um, the only kind of, not nice, I don't know how to word it, but Darren and Angie, Becky's stepmom and her dad, have remained together. They are together. They... You know, and she never, she never tried to defend her son, not once. She, to be honest, said even the story of murder, the kidnapping, she says it's a lie. You know, obviously a mum will know her son. And rather than choosing to defend him blindly, she, she, because she, she'd been Becky's mum since she was two, you know, and Darren was, a, you know, Becky's dad was her husband, you know, and they are still together. And I, th I think that's really nice, four years on, you know, that they've had each other to get through that time. I think that's, you know, at least they didn't destroy that as well. Um, but, yeah, that's the story of Becky Watts. Uh, what is it with 
brothers and yeah, the dismembering, dismembering and not clocking that CCTV is everywhere. What is wrong with these people? But thank you again for joining me. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I'll pop a link in the box and you can see the two that I'm talking about. Weird, weird looking couple. Um, and a picture of Becky and you'll see what I mean. Lovely, little, lovely young girl. Little girl, she was little. She was a lovely young girl. And if you've got any comments, pop them in the box. And if you feel like subscribing, I'd really appreciate it. And yeah, I'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry, I am going. Thank you.